All right, so uh, we have several things that's going on in uh, uh, SIG security. And uh, one of them is the policy. So since it's, to, it's a deep dive, so we said uh, we'll pick cloud native policy. We'll talk about a uh, bunch of stuff around that's happening on cloud native policy as a deep dive for today. Right, so, um, and. And then we're also going to leave time so that if you want to deep dive into other things, we can ad hoc dive into that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, let's make this more interactive because uh, I don't think it's, uh, uh, this is the kind of audience where its presentation is the one that's going to work. So, um, the idea is to give you a brief, brief uh, overview of some of the projects in cloud native policy. Uh, and I think some, pol some projects are more familiar than others. Uh, but there are like a lot of work that needs to happen in cloud native policy for uh, securing the system. Right? So, um, so let's go over this. I mean, like I'm not going to read through the bullet points, but essentially, um, oh, by the way, the person who was supposed to present with me, Howard, I think he couldn't get a visa. Uh, so, uh, so I'm trying to cover for him, but uh, he'd probably be the expert. So you should probably drop by Slack channel, uh, drop into one of our... Uh, meetings so that you could actually ask questions directly to them, to him. Right. So one, one little thing. The policy subgroup meets at four, so that's more comfortable for Cal, um, China time. Yep. Um, so this is a little bit of a history of how uh, SAFE and Policy Working Group came together as uh, CNCF uh, Security Working Group, finally. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the motivation for uh, the policy, the need for policy, and then the need for using policy to secure, and then what does policy provide for security, right? So, um, I mean, whether it's uh, setting the resiliency settings or who sets the resiliency settings, um, or when a, when a service has a PII information, all of them have uh, somewhat of a policy associated with them in terms of like how it can be operated, who can access this, what can be done to this, uh, and specifying something in a meaningful way that can be audited, evaluated, and then uh, proven is a, it's not an easy problem. There's work that's happening here, and I, uh, I'd like to uh, get your attention on that work and then uh, get at least some of you excited about uh, that work in general, right? So, <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, this is actually huge. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much, uh, how many people are theoreticians here. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, creating a formal verification for any system is super hard. And especially when it comes to security, it's, it, there's a lot at stake, and that makes it even harder, right? So uh, there is an attempt that's going on in terms of creating a formal verification engine in uh, the policy working group. And the idea for the formal verification engine is to use the policies, uh, be able to verify the policies, and then verify the execution correctness of policies, and then verify that if there are any overlaps or <laughs> conflicts or anything that happens, the verification engine will basically tell you about the conflicts, which is huge. I don't know how many of you have written policies that you uh, can comprehend, but then when 10 of them write the policies that they can comprehend and all of them working together, um, it's a huge nightmare, right? So being able to have a verification engine that can actually execute the policy and then tell you a proper verified response, it's, uh, it's a big problem. So the approach is, uh, approach is somewhat like this. It's not a final thing. Uh, there is work in progress, and then there is like some, some amount of uh, code also written to do some of these. So I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at it. And if there is any mathematicians here, you'd be super excited to do <laughs> any of those. Right? So that is one. Uh, the idea for formal verification itself 
like I told you before, it's to prove that the policies are correctly defined, to prove that uh, the, subject that the subject on which you're writing the policies are the subjects that you would want to write, and then the acti actions on those subjects are verifiable actions that exist for that subject. So all those are, uh, all those are done in that verification language. And then, like I told you, there's to prove that there are no con conflicting policies that exist among all the policies that get defined. Right? And uh, <coughs> it's, it's not done as a theoretical exercise, and uh, that's the thing that we say. Uh, it's done in collaboration with some of the financial customer use cases. So there is some validity to it. Um, just to give you an overview of how the engine itself works. Um, the intents are specified, and then there is a specification language that you could go look at what the language looks like. And then, um, and then translation of that specification happens uh, by doing an encoding of, the, encoding of what, what gets specified there. That's when some, some amount of parsing happens there. And then the policy configuration, final uh, output is a policy configuration that gets produced, which goes through the verification engine for saying if there are any conflicts, things are done right. right? So, and if there are any errors, then again, it pops back and then it keeps looping. So this, this is what, this is where the work resides. So if anybody wants to contribute or take a look, comment on it or anything, feel free to do it. Uh, So the other thing that's happening in uh, policy land itself is uh, policy-related white paper. I mean, there is a uh, overall security-related white paper that's, that's also getting worked on. Uh, but the, there's another white paper which is purely centered around policies and then uh, how does a policy architecture look like and uh, all the case studies that we've... Actually, there are a bunch of case studies that we went through prior. So all those case studies are compiled and presented there. If not anything, I think those are going to be much more useful for uh, taking a look at. So um, again, the same thing, like the deliverable for that is to figure out like what are the long-term stuff that's happening in this land and then be able to educate uh, people on those. So this is some of the sample projects that has been looked at to create the white paper itself. Um, I'm not an expert in any of these projects, maybe some of them. Uh, I can talk about Spiffy, but the, uh, the idea here is to expose various different projects that use policies or are the provider of a policy engine that actually enforces uh, a formal verification for, for, I mean, enforces policies on uh, run times. Right? So, I mean, obviously, people know Kubernetes and what Kubernetes does. Um, but let's look at the things that people didn't know. Like all the grayed out ones are something that people already know. The ones that aren't grayed out are the ones that we are going to highlight and talk about and get your attention to for that. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, purely because I don't know the details. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is an overlay, pro overlay engine on top of all the resources that get defined on Kubernetes where uh, uh, it's called I'm probably going to butcher the name, but I'll say it anyway. Kiverno. So all the resources that get defined, uh, defined in uh, Kubernetes, it does validate, mutate, and uh, uh, all, all the activities that happen, it goes through the policy engine, and then it verifies if the actions are correct. Uh, it's not intrusive. It's more, li more like a verification mechanism. But I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. Uh, participate in the project, or bring it back to SIG security for discussion, or policy group for discussion. Uh, Cloud Custodian is another one. I actually don't know much about it, so do you know about Cloud Custodian? About it. Okay. So Cloud Con Custodian monitors your policy, monitors what the state of your system is and whether it's conforming to the policy, so it's a compliance checker. Oh. Let's see, next one. Next one, if you know. Okay. Kira, all right. Kirill, this is from Cruise. Uh, I have no idea about this. All right, this one I can talk to. 
so this comes from Cystic Falco. Um, they are uh, presenting to TOC uh, runtime policy interface. It's sort of like the um, container runtime interface, but imagine that for policies. It is very, uh, I'm excited about it personally. I think it makes a lot of sense for uh, uh, creating tooling on top of it, creating like multiple different runtimes on top of it to basically provide uh, provide a way for growing the ecosystem in general. Right? But uh, the core of it is, uh, uh, core of what it defines is what do you care about from a runtime system that needs to be used for policy. Right? And that is, a, that is an important piece. Like uh, All these interfaces don't make sense if there is no consistency in what the data that gets produced are. And the objective for the runtime policy interface is to basically standardize on uh, events and uh, attributes that get generated from the runtime system so a policy, consistent policies can be enforced on them. Um, it's a very, uh, it, yeah, there's a lot of work that's going to, that went into that to do this. I'd encourage uh, all of you to take a look at it, comment on it, and uh, it, it is there, it's actually, there is a issue for this in uh, SIG security, right? To talk about this. Well, there, um, we're, right now there's a TOC vote for, that is like in process for Falco, and we're waiting on their assessment. So there were, the next up, they will do a self-evaluation. So it's not, there's not much to see on the issue. You can chime in if you're interested, and then you'll get notified when it moves forward. Yeah. So do that, and uh, I think we might be at the end of, yeah, join the conversation. Yeah, that's mostly what we had. Um, I mean, there is this other, um, we didn't talk a lot about the other known uh, policy evaluator, like Kubernetes, OPA, Cilium, Spiffy, uh, Tough, and Notary. But let's take the conversation where people in the room want to take it. So um, we'd welcome to hear, like, if you are passionate about doing something in security policy compliance, all the umbrella of SIG security, um, and you think that something ought to be happening and you're wondering if there are other people interested or if you have a question, this is a good time. And we only have one mic, I'm told, so. Yeah, so if, did you have a question? So how does the participation work uh, with security, uh, SIG security? What all is involved and how much time can people devote? And I mean, how does it work? So, um, so we have a new member, is Manoj here? So we have a new members page created by one of our new members. Well, it was a while back, but because um, we, after every KubeCon, we usually have a lot of new members and we didn't, have quite the infrastructure, so um, that, you can check it out in the repo, but basically, you become a member by actively doing something for a little while, show up at meetings if it's time zone friendly for you, um, but we aspire to have people be able to work asynchronously without having to come to the meeting each time, and so, um, so the best way to get involved is to read the PRs that are open and comment on them look through the issues and comment on things that you think, you know, you'd be interested in. We have a, a we basically have, for the community-driven things, we have two classes of issues. One is a proposal, which means I'm willing to lead this project. And if it's in the proposal state and not yet made a project, that means somebody has raised their hand and said, I will lead this thing. But if more people are willing to get involved, that really helps it move forward. And then there are suggestions, which means I need this, or I think it would be really important to do this, but I don't necessarily know how to do it. I don't have the skills or the qualifications, or maybe I'm just a little maxed out right now. And so if you see a suggestion and it's something you have enthusiasm for, that's a great thing to comment on and you know, raise at a meeting. And then we have the meeting notes are linked from the readme, and anyone can queue up a topic where it's great if there's like an issue first, but don't let that stop you from queuing up a topic. And then we'll, um, then we'll, you know, sort of, the group decides which of the proposals we're going to kind of put our effort behind so we're not doing too many things at once. 
And then we have a policy work stream that we talked about in the deep dive today. We also have a security assessments work stream where um, one project at a time, we're picking open source projects to look at their security posture and what's the threat model and what are their processes. And that's really envisioned as complementary to an audit and in the future will be before the audits, but some of, you know, we started in the middle. Yeah, so privacy is part of our um, concern. Other questions? Yes. I'll, I'll just repeat it. So. Oh, you want to bring, just come on up? So I, this is my first meeting and interaction with you, so really excited to talk, talk to everyone. Uh, one of the things, uh, as a, I'm an end user basically for Kubernetes uh, and some of the other cloud native stuff, one of the things we try trying to understand is security is as much as anything but defense in depth. So from perspective of defining policies, uh, what we were trying to understand is le we have a way through network policies to define a policy which follows leash privilege principle. And then if we just follow it at that level, then there is a chance that if you have misconfigured a policy, then the leash privilege is not being uh, ma managed correctly. So as a result of that, what we thought is, can we do the same policy enforcement at application layer using authorization policies? So in a way, across the OSI layer, the identity is unique through maybe Spiffit. But in a way, I still have a single source of truth for policies, but it gets applied at multiple layers. So is that something you have talked about or thought from the policy automation and runtime using the Guardian uh, tool that you mentioned? Why don't you take that? And maybe summarize that a little bit for people yeah. who are less. Yeah, that's a, that's a super loaded question though. Um, so the essence of that question is uh, there is a context that gets created at the application level and then there is policy that is uh, set up and uh, obviously requests flow through like multiple layers, uh, whether it's compute layer, network layer, and then to the other um, end application or end user. but. Is there a comprehensive way to define, uh, semantically define something with contextually at the application level that will also apply at the network level, right? So, um, I mean, right now it's super fragmented, right? Right now there is, uh, uh, there, there is an effort to try and describe the landscape itself in a much cleaner way, where we'd be able to we'd be able to like articulate this policy correctly. So, right, uh, the an short answer to your question is like there is nothing that exists right now. Uh, the thing that we are trying to do is like we are uh, one of the motivation for starting the six security outside of Kubernetes is specifically to address that concern. It's not a compute problem. Uh, sometimes security is a network problem, compute problem, storage problem, and everybody's problem, right? So. Uh, that was the motivation b behind which like uh, three of us came together to start the SIG security uh, outside of Kubernetes as an ecosystem. Uh, so having said that, Spiffy is like the first, uh, I, first attempt at trying to create an identity that can spawn across the layers. So if you, uh, if you look at it, because traditional security models are like everything is bundled in like each layer. Uh, database has its own user management. Network will have its own uh, subnet and uh, firewalling rules. And then application will have its own uh, hard-coded embedded authorization policies and rules that em embed within the application. So trying to peel that off into a different layering mechanism uh, by, by allowing you to create identity first uh, and then authentication, uh, that basically gives you a verified identity at that next level. That basically allows you to do uh, either authorization or policy enforcement or uh, things like things of that nature that you could do on top. <laughs> and then you need verification to auditing and verification. And then you do the compliance check for like if things that I told you to happen are happening, right? This layering has never existed. 
so far. And one of our charter is to produce a white paper. So the, there's a pending white paper that we are working on. So uh, to illustrate that this layering is complex, and then if you take this layering and go across like infrastructure, each one will touch like multiples of these to make sure that uh, that works. So, so there are efforts. Uh, it's not a full solution yet. Uh, OPA is another way you can represent policies that you can enforce. Uh, but there is an, uh, there are multiple things that need to happen. Like you need to create languages. You need to be able to create uh, domain-specific abstractions to be able to say this domain only has these entities that you'd have to deal with. And we all know about those entities and then be able to specify the policies so that the context propagation happens across the layers, right? So, uh, so that's a long-winded long answer for like things that need to happen to get there. Uh, things that exist right now are Spiffy and OPA. Also, I think Intuno plays a role here. Supply chain, yeah. Supply chain is another part of the problem that you'd have to deal with. So we have one of the Intoto members here who's been an active member of the group, um, Intoto maintainers, active member. Um, and you know, because if you have a workload identity and you don't know the provenance of your code, <laughs> it could be anything and your supply chain's hacked, it doesn't really matter that you're verifying the identity. So what, in a lot of ways, we're doing a bottoms up approach where we're engaging with the projects that are doing security as well as with projects that are, everybody should be using security. And then in the group, we have mostly practitioners, mostly people who are making tools, so, um, some people who are having, you know, what the CNCF calls end users. In our personas, we also include the end end user um, because we need to worry about the security of our customers, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then we have some folks from government. And so we're tr really trying to create a cross-section of the people who have concer security concerns. And because policy really starts with, like, the words of what you want to enforce, which is sometimes not as clear as we'd like it to be with legislation always changing. So, so yeah, it's a work in process, Pro work in progress. <laughs> that would be great. Additional questions or observations or comments? Yes. So, um, so we did. We we do want to do some validation with the end user community. We're connected with Cheryl to see if we can get some stakeholders who want the white paper in parallel with developing the content. Um, but the initial vision for it is that the the sort of overarching white paper is for people who are. Um, leaders of their company in some way who are security experts but maybe new to cloud, right? That there's a great demand for people who are like, I know all about security and I've read a lot about cloud and now I'm the one who has to say yes, no to a million things. And how do I come up to speed quickly on that? And so that's the current thinking that we're going to validate a little bit about the audience. And then maybe, JJ, why don't you talk a little bit about the content? Because we had yeah. a brainstorm a yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so there are, again, uh, I, I'm assuming you're talking about the uh, security high-level white paper, not the policy white paper. Policy white paper, is a, it's already there. Like, there's a lot of content there. I, I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. It's very well done. Um, the, uh, for the security, six security white paper itself, uh, um, when I was answering his question, the way I was layering it out, those are the things that will come out in that white paper in terms of like what does the architecture for security itself, cloud native security, would look like, A. And then uh, like what Sarah was saying, like what do end users care about doing with cloud native security, right? So do I have to create a VPN or can I rely on layer seven? Uh, it's not an easy question to answer. And uh, it's something like uh, how much of it is basically the old practice that you've had versus like how much of it is like a real security problem that you deal with. Uh, we want to be more precise on these. So it'll take, it'll take a lot of time. I mean, like it's not an easy problem <laughs> to solve and we don't want to be like, uh, uh, we don't want to be overly prescriptive, 
but we want to be uh, useful in the white paper so that it's actually useful for the end users, right? So that's the reason why we need to validate a lot with the end users to make sure that this is something that appeals. And uh, like what Pushkar was asking, if that makes uh, some of these things, if it if you start like coming into the SIG security and then start talking about like what what you're facing, uh, that'll help uh, encourage the white papers content too. But what you'd expect from what you should expect from the white paper is uh, uh, sort of like n not like the CNCF landscape, but uh, a somewhat of an architecture stack in terms. How do you care about? How should you think about security? Not in like one silo, but across. And then what does each one provide? And then what are the options that you have? And for each one, uh, there should be a way for us to specify um, what your coverage, security coverage is going to look like, right? So obviously, uh, when you're operating operating at the application level, it's hard to guarantee uh, an operating system that's not compromised. And what does it look like if it's if you don't have a control over the operating system, which probably most uh, when you're running workload on any cloud, it's probably a sure bet that you don't have, then how do you guarantee, right? So there are some work done there. Uh, Evan Gilman from Spiffy, he has done some work on uh, <coughs> taking in SHAs from like all the way hard HSM to the version of operating system to like combine it and create one, which you could use, usually use to verify as a signature of like, is this a OS that I can validate, right? So there are some work there, but some of it is theoretical, some of it is like, Oh, it looks cool, let me try it out kind of thing. But it's still valid for security context. But a lot of conversation is the one that's going to actually help define that. No, not yet. I mean, it's still, it'll take some time. So, but it, uh, but what we want, like what Sarah was saying is... A so there's a very rough outline that is not, doesn't include a lot of the stuff that JJ says, <laughs> said right now, that is linked from an issue. So you could... But we're not really encouraging people to spend a lot of time with that because our thinking has been evolving. And so, um, so, and we wanted to get the security assessment team off the ground before we dove into the white paper. So it's that kind of work in process. But I just wanted to also point out one of the things that, this is kind of an example of our bottoms up approach. We created this draft landscape like six, nine months ago. A little team got together and wrote this up and nobody was happy with it, but it was at least a set of categories of like, these are the different things that compose cloud native security. And what, and this is a sort of a common thing we do. We'll put something out there, it's a draft. And now actually after quite some time, there's two PRs open adjusting these because our goal is to make it so that if you have a security related project, it would go in one of these categories. <laughs> Not all of them. I mean, some of the Kubernetes might kind of go in all of them, but you know, like Kubernetes is arguably many projects, right? Like the way Helm split off, we, I'm anticipating that a, no, a bunch of Kubernetes might get refactored like that, and we're seeing the newer projects are much more focused. So it's a question about um, will the white paper have practical advice? And so we, this is, I think, um, am I inferring from this that you're looking for practical advice? Is it to turn the question back around to you? Yeah, I mean, to a certain degree, like, uh, is this something that we can do now? To, and that especially, like, what kind of tooling is available out there? So, um, so our current thinking about the white paper, it's an overview of the landscape like, like the, and the architecture and the concerns you need to have and may list a bunch of projects to look at, but not necessarily be proscriptive because we, I think that there are, we don't, we want to capture where there is, our different practices across the community. And we are focused on cloud native, not necessarily Kubernetes. So there's a lot of other cloud native things that aren't, like it's hard to be prescriptive if you're not vendor specific. And so um, there's been, there's a lot of interest in best practices. And if you ask any one of us, we would be able to tell you what we think they are, but we're working hard as a community to not get into a contentious battle, 
but rather have the practices emerge and get documented. And um, usually as a community I found everybody agrees on what not to do. It's harder to get agreement on what to do. But I think that we generally have been able to come up with, well, here's a set of practices, pick one of them. They're probably gonna work well for you. Um, but like I said, we're taking this bottoms up approach. So we don't yet have the, okay, this is what you do. And we're working on, there are great resources that I can't think of off the top of my head for like, this is how you secure Kubernetes. And there's classes on that. And what we wanna do is be a little bit of a clearing house for when those resources, when there are great resources elsewhere, we don't have to reproduce them, um, but curate them. And I'd also like to bounce back to you and ask you, what do you want in a white paper? Yeah, yeah. With, with right, right. Yeah, I mean, um, the idea for the white paper itself is to provide you the context. Uh, there'll be like at least three separate efforts in terms of trying to get to the, get an answer for your thing uh, from the way we look at it. Uh, that'll give you the context. Then there'll be effort to provide uh, like the best practices. Um, that's a different effort than white paper itself. And then the third one, which is a constant evolving process, is uh, the one that we'll be doing as a group together, is identifying tools that fit the either the guidelines that are missing or uh, the landscape or the uh, stack in where where the where the holes are. And so we need that's going to be a constant evolving process. There are going to be tools coming up uh, that we need to be constantly evaluating and then put, pushing it into CNCF land, landscape. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think I kind of agree with his point. Uh, as, as someone who is not a contributor but uses uh, cloud native projects, what ends up happening, especially with security, is there are 120 best practices about every single project. And everyone is trying to say, do that, do this. And then what ends up happening is it becomes really overwhelming where at some point of time you're not sure whether you even want to do any of those. Uh, so what for uh, in our experience helped was, and this is probably just very opinionated from my perspective, is... Hey, 